Well, happy Easter. If you are visiting with us this morning, we welcome you to Higher Heights Christian Fellowship. Is there anybody that's never been here before visiting with us today? Welcome. What, who's that? Amy, yes? Have you fellows been here before? Yeah. Well, we have a little gift for you just to say thank you for coming and sharing your Easter morning with us. We appreciate that so much. Well, the resurrection is the most important day in all of history. Would you agree with that? The most important event that ever took place because Jesus died for our sins and he rose from the grave. And because he did that, it changes everything. If he didn't rise from the dead, then it, it, I mean, it's just a nice martyr story that probably would have been lost in the annals of time. But if he did resurrect, then it means so much more than that. And so Good Friday, we talked about Jesus' crucifixion in that he was forsaken for me. He was accused for me and punished for me. But the truth of all of those things hinges on the resurrection. Because if the resurrection didn't actually occur, then none of those statements would matter. And so he did rise again, and I want to show you some things about the resurrection this morning. I want to share with you three things that are wrapped around the undeniable fact that Jesus did rise again. I'm going to begin by bouncing off the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 to 15. It says this, After the Sabbath at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and, all, and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, and going to the tomb, um, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they sh shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen just as he said. Come and see the place where he lays. Then go quickly and tell the disciple, He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid, yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. While the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. When the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, You are to say, His disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. If this report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of the out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed, and this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. So there's been lots of different stories that people have said over the years as to reason out that maybe it really didn't happen. But we have accounts that that tell us that it did. The resurrection accounts are reliable. Jesus was seen by many. If all we had in the Bible was the record of the empty tomb, then that wouldn't be proof enough to make it work. An empty tomb could be explained a number of ways. And, you know, people could have taken the body, uh, enemies could have stolen it, but the testimony of the empty tomb is backed up by resurrection appearances. Matthew was one of the disciples that was there during all of this. And so here he writes as a first eyewitness testimony, and he places his signature on the fact that it was first discovered by women. In those days, women's testimonies were not considered credible. It was not even admissible in court. That was just the nature of the day. 
And so if Matthew was just making this up in order to try and get people in his generation to believe, then why would he use women for his first eyewitnesses? He would choose men to do that. The 11 apostles, they also saw them, but saw Jesus, but he, they were not the only ones. The New Testament writers pointed to hundreds of people still alive at the time of their writings who can verify the resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15, 5 to 8. He was seen by Peter and then by the 12. After that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time. And then he was seen later by James and all the other apostles. And Paul, as he writes this, says, last of all, I saw him. Remember what happened to Paul? He had that great encounter with Jesus. And then the disciples, they died for that testimony. And we know that including Matthew, they died in horrific ways to the fact that they had seen Jesus raised from the dead with their own eyes. Now, would they make something like that up if they were to face death? They faced death in torturous ways, horrific ways. They were crucified. They were beaten. They were stripped. They were flogged. They were anything that they could think of. The Romans were ruthless. And so they were um, killed for their faith. They were killed for their testimony. Why would they do that if it wasn't true? They would have nothing to gain from that. And so we have the fact that you know, we wouldn't, anybody wouldn't die for a lie. Would you die for a lie if you knew? And then the resurrection grants us power. First of all, for salvation. Romans 1.16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. There is power in the resurrection that is able to bring people because after that, he sent the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit draws people's hearts. And there is power for salvation for everyone who believes. Without the resurrection, the gospel would not have reached us. Without the resurrection, we wouldn't have any, any account for salvation. The resurrection is the culmination of the gospel. If the resurrection never happened, the account of Jesus couldn't be reliable. If that didn't happen, who's to say that all the other signs, wonders, and miracles that he did happened? And because of the resurrection, the gospel was empowered to deliver salvation to the world. And then for the baptism of fire, the resurrection grants us power for the baptism of fire. Acts 2, 1 to 4 talks about Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came and they were all filled with the power of the Holy Spirit that seemed like tongues of fire, and they began to speak in other tongues. The power of that baptism enabled Peter to give his first amazing sermon. The power of that baptism enabled them to be witnesses to the gospel. If Christ did not resurrect from the dead, the Holy Spirit would not have been sent. The Holy Spirit became proof of the validity of the resurrection. And scripture says it became a deposit of what is to come, the deposit of the hope of eternal life. The Holy Spirit is the power source which enables us to carry the gospel message with confidence of the risen Savior and to have boldness. And then the resurrection grants us freedom from sin. Romans 8, 1 to 2. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Isn't that good? We don't have to fear condemnation from God any longer. Because, it says, through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free. Have you been set free this morning? It's because of the resurrection and the power from the resurrection that we can say that we are free from sin. It doesn't mean that we're sinless. We, we, we're we still human. We still fail. We still do stuff. We shouldn't. But the power of the resurrection allows us to receive forgiveness for that, 
allows us to go back to the Father and just repent and say, I'm sorry. The power of the resurrection allows us to remain in a place where we have constant connection with God in order for that to happen. We're empowered to live free from the natural gravitational pull towards sin. People who are not saved, it's, it's an automatic state of perpetual living in sin because they do, that's what sinners do. But Christ has set us free from the state of having to perpetually live in a state of sin. And then for witnessing, Acts 1.8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses. And then 1 Thessalonians 1.5, because our gospel came to you, not simply with words, but with power. The Holy Spirit gives that power that we don't have to demonstrate just with words. The gospel is not just to be about words. The gospel is to be a demonstration. We can demonstrate the gospel on, in how we act, how we behave, how we speak, how we live, and also to step into the arena of signs, wonders, and miracles. That means we show evidence that what we are talking about is true. And then the resurrection grants us power to live and accomplish things for God, for the kingdom. 2 Thessalonians 1.11, so we keep on praying for you, asking our God to enable you to live a life worthy of his call, that he might give you the power to accomplish all the good things your faith prompts you to do. This is life lived by faith in the Son of God who gave himself for us. We are able to be ones who accomplish God leads our heart to do things, and we have the power to be able to accomplish those things. We don't just have to think about them. We can actually step out and accomplish things. And this is to bring to fruition good things which further the testimony of Jesus. And then the resurrection grants us power to share in his divine nature. 2 Peter 1, 3, and 4, by his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. And it says, these are the promises that enable you to share his divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. Because he's the head and we are the body, we can share in his divine nature. Not that we're God, but we share in what he provides for his church. We share in... His, his power, we can share in his glory, we can share in living life to emulate who he is. And so we share in his divine nature. Why? To be his reflection. We need to reflect who Jesus is. To live through his power. The hope of eternity with him and being made like him. When does eternity start? For those who believe. Right now. The moment we are saved, the moment we have, have asked Christ to take control of our life, that's when eternity starts. We don't have to wait until he comes or wait till after the grave. Eternity starts now. And that's why we can participate in what he is doing in the world. And what is he doing in the world? He's wanting to tell the world the gospel. He's wanting to have his church witness to the fact that he rose again and he lives forevermore. He's wanting the world to know that we can have and share in the power of that resurrection. The same spirit who raised Christ from the dead lives in? And that means we can share in what the Holy Spirit gives us. We carry his DNA. You thought about that? We carry the DNA of Jesus through the, through the Holy Spirit. His lifeblood flows through our veins if we are saved. The resurrection grants us power to fight the spiritual war. 2 Corinthians 10, 3-5. We are human, but we don't wage war as humans do. We use godly weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down strongholds 
of human reasoning and to destroy false arguments. We destroy every proud obstacle that keeps people from knowing God. We capture their rebellious thoughts and teach them to obey Christ. We are in a, a spiritual war. And how many know that war is, is not quiet? How many know that war is not fought by staying still? How many know that war is not fought by not having the weapons and accessing the weapons in our arsenal? And so we need to get to know the weapons that we have access to in the Bible. There's lots, lots of weapons, and we need to know the weapons that we have so we can use them. Spiritual weapons are for knocking down strongholds, destroying false arguments and proud obstacles, capturing rebellious thoughts and so much more. There are people that need to be set free in this day. Would you agree with that? And we who have the weapons of warfare need to know how to use them. And so the resurrection grants us power to be able to do that. And then third, the resurrection affords us breakthrough. And that's the theme of our year, breakthrough. We need to have resurrection breakthrough. Who wants that? Resurrection breakthrough in every area of our life. So I went to Miriam Webster and checked in the dictionary for a definition of breakthrough. So we know exactly what we're doing. And the definitions that she or he or whoever wrote it gave is, is not things that we might find verbatim in the Bible, using those words, but we find um, reference in the Bible to the definition that is given. Okay, you with me? Okay, so breakthrough, first, a sudden advance, especially in knowledge or technique. And so where do we find that in scripture for breakthrough? Well, how about the disciples on the road to Emmaus, Luke 24, 30, and 31. As they sat down, you remember the disciples on the road to Emmaus? Jesus joined them as they were walking along, and they were kind of wondering you know, what happened? We thought we had the Savior, and he's gone, he's dead, and but Jesus joined them, and he starts to have conversation with them, and then as they sat down to eat, he took the bread and blessed it, and then he broke it and gave it to them, and suddenly, say suddenly, their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and at that moment, he disappeared. They had an advance in their knowledge. There was a suddenly in that moment. How about Saul's conversion in Acts 9, 3, and 4? As he was approaching Damascus on this mission, a light from heaven suddenly shone around him, and he fell to the ground, heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He had a suddenly, and that sudden advance, especially in his knowledge that he needs to change, God is real, he needs to figure out a different way of doing ministry. And then Paul's prayer for the church in Ephesians 1, 16 to 20, he says, I pray for you constantly, asking God, the glorious Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, to give you spiritual wisdom and insight. Why? So that you might grow in your knowledge of God. I pray that your hearts would be flooded so you can understand the hope to which he's called. We need to have some suddenly moments where we have that sudden advance, especially in knowledge or technique. The second definition was breakthrough is an act or instance of moving through or beyond an obstacle. Well, there's lots of reference for that in Scripture. First of all, in 2 Corinthians 6.17, it says, Therefore, Come out from among unbelievers and separate yourself from them, says the Lord. Move to a different place. And I will bless you. Move from loving the world into loving God. 
Move yourself from one place to another, and I will bless you. And see, you know, we have obstacles in our faith. Those are things that need to be knocked down. Obstacles such as doubt. There's the obstacle of fear. There's the obstacle of believing the lies of the enemy. There's the obstacle of hopelessness. You know, what's the use? That can become a big obstacle for people. They lose hope. Maybe God's not answering my prayer, you know, as I thought he would or that he should or soon enough or whatever. Or this is happening so God can't be real. Hopelessness. There's an obstacle of healing that needs to be had from past situations. You know, we have many people that suffer from traumatic events in their past, and those things become obstacles to them moving forward in their faith. There are obstacles to walking in power, such as fear and doubt again. People who have an unteachable spirit, I know it all. People who deal with pride, you can't tell me what to do. People who suffer with unforgiveness, that is huge, folks. Unforgiveness is huge. If we really knew the power of forgiveness, then things would and could be a lot different. Unforgiveness is huge. And unforgiveness is something that will often hold things like doubt and fear in their place. And how about the obstacle of loving the world, loving sin? I, I really don't want to move past that just yet. Well, no, God says you got to move past it. Love me instead. And then the next definition was an instance of passing through a barrier or protection. Hmm. Well, we see that when Peter escaped from prison in Acts 12, 6 to 11. It says, the night before Peter was to be placed on trial, he was fast asleep, fastened with two chains between two soldiers. He tried to make it so impossible because they, they knew what he had been up to that he wasn't going to escape as far as they could help it. And suddenly there was a bright light in the cell and the angel of the Lord stood before Peter. The angel struck him on the side to awaken him and said, quick, get up. And the chains fell off his wrist. Then the angel told him, get dressed put on your sandals, and he did. Now put on your coat and follow me. See, the angel gave him very specific instructions, didn't he, for dressing. So Peter left the cell following the angel. He thought he was in a vision, but when he got outside the gate, he realized, hey, cool. And so he was busted out of prison. He passed through the barrier, passed through what the guards thought was protection. And then how about Paul and Silas, Acts 16, 25 to 30, around midnight when they were in prison. They were praying and singing hymns to God and other prisoners were listening. And suddenly, here's another suddenly, there was a massive earthquake and the prison was shaken to its foundations and all the doors immediately flew open. The chains fell off every prisoner. The jailer woke up wondering what in the world is going on. And he was ready to do himself in because he would be in trouble if his prisoners escaped. But what happened? Because all the prisoners were still there, because Paul was still in the groove, that, that jailer got saved. How about Moses crossing the Red Sea, Exodus 14? God said, pick up your staff and raise your hand over the sea and divide the water so the Israelites can walk right through the middle of the sea on dry ground. That sea was a barrier, but God showed him how to remove that barrier. How about Jesus passed through the crowd that was about to kill him? Luke 4, 29 and 30. The crowd didn't like what he was saying. He was declaring who he was. And so jumping up, it says they mobbed him and forced him to the edge of the hill on which the town was built, and they intended to push him over the cliff. But what did Jesus do? He walked right through the barrier of that crowd and disappeared. It says he carried on doing what he was doing. 
And then the last definition, warfare, an offensive military assault that penetrates and carries beyond a defensive line. Well, we see that in Scripture, don't we? We see that in Scripture, don't we? In many cases. How about Gideon? When he brought his troops that God had cut down and cut down and cut down in number, and that small number compared to what he had, just with the sudden clanging of their cymbals and the shouts with their trumpets and making noise with their pots. And they gave a shout, and they were able to defeat the army that they were going against. How about the walls of Jericho? They gave that shout with a trumpet blast, and what happened? Walls came down. How about for spiritual warfare? You don't think of Jesus' temptation in the wilderness as maybe spiritual warfare, but he needed to stand his ground, didn't he? And he defeated the enemy, resisted temptation through the power of the word. How about our temptations? We can do the same thing. When we feel tempted to do wrong or to sin or to say that thing we really shouldn't say, we can use the power of the word of God. It says, put on the full armor of God. That's offensive and defensive. Offensive and defensive. There are weapons that we just have to stand with. And there are weapons that we actually have to use. And we need to know how to use both offensive and defensive weapons. How about Jesus delivering people from demons? That would be an offensive military assault on the demonic world, wouldn't it? How about Jesus telling Satan to get behind him when he addressed Peter? Peter was, no, Lord, you're not going to die on the cross. No, 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 no. And what did Jesus say? He saw past Peter and spoke directly to the enemy and said, get behind me. And then we are more than conquerors. We have the victory. We can be more than conquerors. Amen. Through Jesus Christ and through the resurrection, that gives us breakthrough in every situation in life. <coughs> Excuse me. We don't have to live life in bondage. We don't have to live life defeated. We have breakthrough. And that's what I want to really focus on this month, is resurrection breakthrough. We're called to live in freedom, Galatians 5.13. It says, for you have been called to live in freedom. The truth will set us free. Jesus said, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. What is the truth? Those of you who were here when I spoke to the youth, what is truth? Yeah, this here is truth. And it will set us free if we put the truth into practice. And then freedom from the power of sin. Romans 6, 7 to 13. When we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. And since we died with Christ, we will also live with him. Now, don't get freaked out when it says, since we died with Christ. The fact that we were born again, the fact that we became Christian, it means that we died to our old self and we are embracing the new self, the new life that Jesus gives us. And so we were set free from the power of sin. We don't have to let it cause us bondage anymore. It says, instead, give yourself completely to God, for you were dead, but now you have life. So use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. Freedom from bondage that makes a slave to sin. 2 Peter 2.9, for you are slave to whatever controls you. If there's a hurt, a habit, a hang-up that controls us, then we are slave to that. We can't move past that. And so we need to deal with those things so that we can move past it. 
Romans 6, 6, we know that our old sinful nature was crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. Then it says, we are no longer slaves to sin. Amen. No longer slaves. And so the resurrection, when we think back to our scripture at the beginning, it caused that, that fear, that awe among the women who first discovered it. And it should leave us in awe as well. If the resurrection is true, and because the resurrection is true, it means that Jesus who is who he says he is. It means that he accomplished what he said he accomplished. It means the Son of God, creator of all, put his feet on planet Earth, entered into our pain, our guilt, our shame, took all those things upon himself, and he died in our place. And it should cause us to have that awe, but also of joy, because it means that for me, all those promises are true. Point to yourself. For me, all the promises in here are true. I can grab onto them, and I can, I can access them and put them into practice. It means that God really does love me. He really does love you. And it means that our pain here is not final. That there is hope that one day we will not have pain. And so the question that we are left with this morning is this. How are you going to respond to it? That's the big question. Will you dismiss it like the Jewish leaders did? who, rather than seeking out the truth, the religious leaders paid off the soldiers who guarded the tomb to keep their mouths shut to what really happened. And you think about it, how could they do that? Why be so determined to cover up something that is true and, and be willing to close your eyes to evidence? You know, you can always find a reason to disbelieve what you want to disbelieve. Just like the Jewish leaders, we can close ourselves off to the evidence that points in the opposite direction to where we think we want to go. Lots of people do this. In their hearts, they know something is special about Jesus, but the implications of him being Lord, they just don't want to concede to that knowledge. And so they find reasons to disbelieve it. So the question is, will you dismiss the resurrection or be moved to worship like the disciples did? The choice of whether you and I receive him is totally up to us. Each one of us has to make that decision. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? This morning can be a salvation call to you if you've not yet accepted Jesus to be your personal Lord and Savior, if you've not yet responded to the gospel, if you've not yet conceded to the power of the resurrection and that it actually happened. Salvation can be yours today if you've not yet done that. And so I just want to ask if there's anybody who has never received Jesus, or maybe who has walked away and needs to recommit to Jesus this morning to make him your Lord and your Savior. Is there anybody who would raise their hand and say, that's me? Salvation can be yours. So, Father, we just thank you that salvation belongs to those who will receive you. Thank you for Easter. Thank you that we have this time every year that we can celebrate Jesus, 
Thank you for dying for our sins, Jesus. Thank you that when the, the leaders pointed at you and condemned you, when you were not guilty, you were taking on the guilt and shame and condemnation that was ours. And thank you that you rose again triumphantly over the grave. You took the keys of sin, death, and the grave. And we thank you that that same victory, the same conquering power can be ours to live a life in power and in victory. And so, Father, we just want to give you all the honor, the glory, and the praise this morning for all that you have done. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Would you stand with me? I'm just going to close with a song. Declaring that our God is victorious. Victorious.